Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast, episode number 204 of the show. I'm Ramon Mejia, and I'm here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. And this week I have five new Lit RPG titles for you folks, and that's going to include three from myself and uh, three uh, from Ian uh, in, in Ian's Picks of the Week. One of those is going to be reviewing the same title though. Uh, and that's going to include this week, uh, including... Level Up Update, Knockout Book Number 2. Uh, also, The Last Time Loop, Max of Rebellion, Volume 1. Uh, and Before the Apocalypse Dungeons of Perdition, Book Number 1, A Little Bitty and Game Lit Adventure. And of course, again, some more reviews from Ions and Ions Picks of the Week. But before we get into any of that, of course, we're going to go into Lit RPG News. <laughs> And in Little RPG News, we're going to begin with a quick story about Magic Dome Books and uh, a, a series that's rather famous um, that they're actually retranslating. Um, Magic Dome Books, the publishing company that translates many of your favorite Russian Little RPG series, announced this week that they were retranslating and re-releasing the Way of the Clan series by Dem um, Mikhailov. Clan Dominance is going to be the new series title. So they're actually doing an entire new relaunch, new translation new editing. Um, this series actually had um, issues with translation work. Um, there was an initial round of translation work from the original stuff that was just not good. The author then, out of his pocket, paid for better translation, and that's what it went to for, for a lot of the series. Um, but lately, the, some of the more recent books that have been published just haven't been doing well. So I think this is part of just like a relaunch campaign to, to try to... Um, do well by this series with better cover art, better marketing possibly, um, and hopefully finishing out the, the series. Um, the is a it's actually a joint project between 1C Publishing and Magic Dome Books, which is really nice. And of course, we'll link to the show notes for the re-release of the first book in that series, which should be out on March 5th, 2020. Um, speaking of more re-releases, uh, there's another book that's doing something similar. Um, the Dungeon Configure by Troy Neenan is actually updated on Amazon, and all the reviews were ported over. It was initially released in um, April of 2018, um, and it just had a bad cover. It really did. I think that was one of the bigger notes in the review I actually gave it when it came out initially. Um, but it was a good story. It, had, it was it's a Dungeon story. Dungeon Master, Moorish. Um, there's rel- not relatively a lot, a lot of Dungeon, of course, in there, but there is Dungeon making. Um, but the, the main character goes outside that engine so it's it's a mix um but it kind of make it definitely makes fun of the genre uh the subgenre and does some weird funny quirky things also gets kind of dark and violent sometimes so i think it was definitely part of the draw for some from some folks um and it actually went with a new publisher um and they edited it they polished it and they got new cover art and a new release and re-released it and i gotta say the, the new cover art definitely kind of highlights the darker aspects of this particular story um, so definitely go check it out if you haven't read it before. Uh, we reviewed it all the way back when it was originally. It's given it a nice, good score, um, despite some, again, technical writing issues um, and some issues with the cover, which hopefully have been addressed with this. I, I did from one of those stories where I didn't think it got as much, um, um, as, as many looks as it should have uh, for, for the kind of good storytelling it did. So this is hopefully a good opportunity for them as well. Um, and in more Little Bridge news, we have a new anthology series from um, some Little Bridge art authors you might know, which include K.M. Dimmerick, A.R. Hollow, uh, Dean Hegeter, Cindy Coep, uh, Troy Neenan, just like Troy Osgood, T.J. Reynolds, uh, Shane Oswald, and much, much more. And a few of the authors I don't actually know or have read before, uh, who may be new to everybody. Um, this is an anthology that says a Little Bridge uh, gives back anthology. And the point of this is that it's going to be a charity. Um, the proceeds from the sale of this particular series or this particular title, um, are going to go to the wounded warrior project. So this is kind of a charity anthology. Um, and if you don't know the wounded warrior project, it's a charity and veteran service organization that offers a variety of programs, services, and events for wounded veterans of military actions following September 11th. 2001. So definitely a good cause. We already, I purchased already a uh, day it came out and which is just today as we're recording. Um, so definitely go give it a read. Um, if for nothing else, then the fact that it does give good, um, give back to the community. Um, there's also a forward by James Hunter and Nicole. So there you go. And that's all for a little bit of news on to stuff that is out now. Um, stuff that came out this week haven't had a chance to read it but it is out and that includes citadel of broken dreams which is the third book in that game makers online series um 
something new from Alex Oakchest is going to be Everything is Worth Killing. So that is out, um, as is something from AP Gore and Patricia Jones, uh, Path of Darkness, Black Flame Online, Liberty. This has, um, I've read some of their works before, wasn't super impressed, um, so I'm hesitant to pick this up, but definitely give it a try, um, just because that's what we do here. Um, also, the fourth and last book in this particular series is called Deadline, After on, After Life Online, book number four from Domino Finn is out. So if you're a fan of that series and you've been following it, um, the fourth book, and I believe this is the last book according to the author's comments, I may be mistaken, but I recall him saying that uh, this completes the series. Uh, it is out now for you to enjoy. And of course, Warriors Tribute also out as well, which I just mentioned in the news section. Um, we don't have as many new lit RPG audiobooks out this week. Um, including, but these are the titles, including Gamer's Love, Alpha World, book number eight is out now for you to enjoy. Um, I believe that is the last book in that series. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, so going to the audiobook, and also we have uh, The Realm, um, Realm of Noria, book number one, The Birth, out as an audiobook. So only a couple titles out for you, audiobook, uh, Liberty Lovers, sorry. Um, we have some t- titles for the upcoming little video list, also some adjustments, um, but definitely feel free to skip ahead if you're not interested in what's coming out. Um, and on December 13th, it'll be Quest of Justice, Hero Online, book number three. Um, December 14th, the Good Guy series, book number seven. They finally got a, uh, an updated cover out there just in time. That's what uh, Eric Uglin usually does, though. Um, December the 15th, it'll be the second book in the Forsaken Talent series. The fourth book in the Respawn series uh, will be out on December the 18th. This is new to the list. We have on December the 18th, Leap of Faith, A Neuro Rising, a Kingdom Building Fantasy Liturgy series. Um, on December the 20th, it'll be the third book in the Chronicles of Ethan series. December the 23rd, it'll be the second book in the Underdog series. This one's new to the list as well here. On December the 26th, the sixth book in the Enora series. So there we go. Um, January 1st is going to be dominated by the Land um, in the Chaos Seed series, book number eight, The Land Monsters. Um, surprisingly, it's not as long as I thought it was going to be apparently only, uh, according to the novel description section, it's like 800, 900 pages. So it's uh, definitely more moderate than the 2000, which was book seven. Um, on January the 6th, it'll be a new series from Vasily Hanko, which is a real life little bitty story. Apparently, um, no mistakes, world of change book number one on January the 9th, it'll be discardian book number three, uh, January's 22nd, uh, dragon heart book number four, January 24th, the fourth book in the Hero Online series. January 31st, this one's new to the list. Um, the second book in the fa- Endless Fantasy Online series called The Elk Kingdom. Um, January 31st, 2019, will also be Ultima uh, Legends Online, book number four. This is also new to the list. Um, the Bad Guys, book number three, will be out on February the 6th. The second book in the Invasion series, out on February the 10th. Uh, February 29th, it'll be Seeds of Chaos, book number four. And last, uh, as far as, uh, there are fewer titles, I think, farther out. Well, way farther, but this is as far as I'm going to look in the future. Uh, March 9th, 2020, is Product Stellar, uh, which is a new um, Little Bridge series published by Magic Dome. So, so it's a Russian translation again. So, so lots of stuff to look forward to. Um, but that's the stuff and upcoming on to uh, new releases and reviews. And first up this week is Level Up Update, the knockout book number two series written by Dan Sergodinov and Max Largno. Um, it is 571 pages, $5.99. It is not available on Kindle Limited as this particular recording of the show. Let me double check that. Nope, still not on Kindle Limited as of this recording. Um, and here is the author's description. Having lost the trial, Hagen didn't just lose his interface and his memory of it, but also everything he'd achieved. His UFC career was ruined before it even began. Stripped of all his skills and abilities, Mike is once again a useless weakling. The last straw is the loss of all the money that he'd bet on his own victory. But you don't remember. You do remember, don't you? That Phil Pavlov promised to take care of his old comrade from Piblu. Can What can Mike achieve with a non combat version of Phil's augmented reality interface? He could, of course, become a businessman or found a gaming startup, but where would he find the money investors he needs? It looks like he might have to start fighting again. However, this time there's no prison guards to maintain order and make sure that the rules are obeyed. Once at a prison, Hagen is fair game for anyone who wants to kill him. Once again, he has to survive on his own. So there we go. 
Uh, full disclosure, I received advanced copy for review. I purchased a copy when it became available. Um, I was genuinely surprised that there's a book two for the series uh, because book one definitely ended on a note where it's like, oh, this is going to tie into the main level up series and it's going to kind of continue on from there. And that, and that does sort of happen to a degree. So when we return to this series in the second book, um, the main, and this isn't, this isn't, in the novel description, so spoilery. Um, the main character has already lost his his RPG interface that he had in book one, um, and so this this definitely feels like a hard reset of this spinoff series. Um, and then the first, like I'm gonna say, fifteen percent of this novel is really just what's described in the novel description, basically just long, long. Um, more of a long description, like, oh, these are all the consequences of him losing that interface, how he's lost all the powers he has, how he's lost all the extra strength and agility and charisma uh, adjustments that happened to his character, or uh, to himself because of that. And then, of course, getting the interface back. Only this one is more like the one from the original main level up series. And I think that's a good thing because that the although the, the first book in this series was definitely more action oriented than that series, um, the RPG interface was not as interesting, at least to me. Um, and so it was really actually a, a pleasure to see a more robust system in book two of this series that, that definitely kind of um, reflects, I want to say Dan Zergonoff's influence, to be honest, um, as far as the RPG mechanics go, from the main level up series. Um, and it, 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 I like it, to be honest, because you get more than just fighting mechanics. You get more than just fighting um, RPG stuff. Um and so there are more social aspects. There's um, computer repair stuff, uh, selling things, non-combat action. So there's a lot more RPG stuff that he can kind of benefit from that I thought was uh, allowed for a greater variety of like pick, picked up and mixed up skills and also just storylines that didn't necessarily have to do with combat all the time. So I think this was a definitely a better balance between just full-on action story and also just other other kind of things that are still revolving around that interface and it, it, and it helping him um, in this real life little RPG story. Um, overall, the story is very, very much slice of life here. Um, it just feels like he's kind of getting the second chance with this new RPG interface. And it, it almost feels like a, a redo of the story. And you could almost jump into this novel and not even have time to read book one in this series. Um, there might be a few places where you're confused as to what happens but for the most part. This is like I said, a kind of a hard restart. Um, and I think it's better for it. And, it, and, and again, that's just me. I liked the, the, um, more robust um, RPG interface. And there's definitely story reasons why there's, this is a different interface than the first book. Um, but, you know, if you just want to enjoy a story that I think this is a nice slice slice story for me, it gets a solid 7.5 out of 10 um, level up update. The knockbook book number two with a score of 7.5 out of 10, a very solid, solid good review. And next we have The Lost Time Loop, Max the Rebellion, volume one, a time travel lit or PG series. Their title actually changed from the, one I had earlier, um, written by Anton Emelianoff and Sergei Sabanov. It is 317 pages. It is $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. And here is the author's description. Max finds himself in a time loop. Any kind of death annuls everything except his present knowledge and returns him to the past. This is a good way to test all sorts of things. That is, it would be if not for one little thing. This loop has real lords, and it's unlikely they'll be happy to hear about an uninvited guest. And that isn't his only problem. All of his memories of the last year have simply disappeared, and the world around him has changed in the meantime. Earth has been seized by the Veli clan and is now part of the Star Empire. Max has also discovered his gift. He's a psychic. However, his power isn't that big of a deal. Anyone can be a level one battery. To do anything else, however, you need to have some talent, money, and connections, which only complicates things further. A whole new world, great opportunities, and lots of chances to get into trouble. Welcome to the last time loop. So there we go. It's actually not a bad description of the story. Um, some of the themes overall, I think, for the series. Um, this is a good story. Um, it kind of had to grow on me, though, before I, I got into it. I would say the first 15% of it was a little bit of a struggle to get through until you kind of started to see the RPG interface a little bit more, at least for me. Um, the the beginning of it just didn't really grab me. Um, but I pushed through, and it, once you started getting into more of the um, time reset aspects of it, and the main character actually exploring how to benefit yourself from it, that then it got interesting to me, and I really enjoyed it from then on. Um, and again, part of the reason the it was harder is just the RPG progression 
is kind of super thin for the entire story, but in the beginning, it's almost not exist. So that was kind of a thing for me. Um, it was really just kind of interesting enough in the story to just follow the main character as he makes different choices, learns about terrible secrets and gains power. Um, of course, he dies again and again and again um, and gets reset each particular time to a particular um, point in his past or in his, in his current memory. Um, but I like also like the fact that even though it's kind of a Groundhog Day kind of time situation, um, each one of these kind of lies he leaves are, is very different from the past ones. So he might make one series of decisions uh, or he might be prepping for his, his next death uh, by, by doing research in this one. And there, there, there are all kinds of like interesting ways the story kind of progresses with that. I thought it was a really well done kind of time travel mechanic. Um, in addition to that, he's not the only one who has this particular ability. who's not caught in this loop. Um, the kind of background for this world is that the world has been conquered by aliens, these blue skin creatures are just what's on the cover. Um, and so there's also an alien presence here with different technologies. So this almost feels like almost a, a less of a real life little bit but also more of a sci-fi ish story as well, since it is set in a future with a, an entirely different set of technologies, including psychic powers and alien battery technology uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. That's kind of neat. Um, so Night stuff there, uh, but for me, it was, it was just kind of fun to follow the main character. Um, and it, it is a kind of slice of life. There's not really like a huge developed plot. There may be a series plot, but there's not really a, a individual story plot. So this is very much a slice of life story where you just follow this main character as he's trying to progress, trying to save his life, um, and 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 grow in power in these different ways. There's also the, like this background stuff, but I'm not going to spoil it for you. On the RPG side of things. Again, things are kind of thin in the story. Um, there's an entire system implemented by the aliens who take over Earth. There are levels, um, but they're associated with a kind of a job system. It's not like this RPG game mechanic necessarily. Um, they, they mentioned in the novel description, uh, main character has a job as a battery, which is kind of a more of a psychic battery, which is explained in the story. Um, and it, and Earthlings and everyone else is used as as like this power source. Uh, and they recharge the entire, entire day. And as they gain more power and they, they practice their psychic skills, they can store and use more energy and they, they go up their level in, in battery system. Um, and this is how, this is technically the power, the, the gradual power growth um, that the novel is using as this kind of loose RPG mechanic. Um, and it is there. There's a, again, a gradual power growth of the main character as he gains power, as he, be, he gains more abilities that he's, he's learning through his different lives. Um, so there is an actual, you know, power curve for the main character. Um, and again, it's not as gamey though, as like other kind of stories with this thing. Um, there's also a clear reputation system in the story that I, I found actually had an impact. Um, I liked the way it was implemented and it was actually nice to see that the way the main character was treated by the police, by the alien societies, his opportunities to advance in the world were all very much tied into his reputation, the reputation system that's in the story. So it was, it was I think that was a nice kind of game mechanic like uh, like system as well. Um, again, the story is technically WG, but again, it's if if you're looking for something that's like really crunchy, really gamey, and like really feels like a trapped in a game kind of thing um, or an MMO, this is not going to feel that way. It's more of a real life. RPG sim. So if you're more like um, his power and his progression is being tracked by a like by a technological interface system. So it's more like the level up series in that rather respect. Overall, I enjoyed the story. I did, but it wasn't really because of the RPG stuff. That was nice. And it keeps it in the little RPG um, kind of category for me, um, especially as the story goes on. It does show more information um, as the story progresses. In the beginning, it's super light though. Um, but the story was kind of good enough as almost a sci-fi story on its own to be enjoyable. Um, I like the time travel stuff. I like the slice of life stuff. And I liked seeing how it unfolded on the main character use this, his, his, each, uh, each life's knowledge that he gained uh, to his, his advantage. Uh, so it was fun. Uh, fair warning though, there was no solid ending. It's not necessarily a cliffhanger as much as like, oh wait, just a to be continued kind of ending. So if that bothers you, don't pick this up um, at least until a couple books in. Uh, but for me, I don't have an issue with it. Um, for me, I enjoyed the story overall. It gets a score of 7.6 out of 10. That's the last time loop. Max of the Rebellion Volume 1, a time travel literary series uh, with a score of 7.6 out of 10. And next up we have Before Apocalypse, Dungeons of Perdition, book number one, a literary gamelet adventure written by uh, Abesk Basu. 
Um, it is 235 pages. It is $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Imagine waking up in a world where you could do whatever you wanted. Be whoever you wanted to be. Imagine being told that you must save this world from the apocalypse. Given this chance, what would you do? Would you complete quests, level up, and use your skills wisely and be the hero you were chosen to, chosen to be? For Travis and Natalie, this question did not have the same answer. Two different lives, two separate journeys, one dark, unforgiving world. Escape your life, embrace the darkness, enter dungeons of perdition. A never-be-seen world where anything is possible, but everything is at stake. How far would you go to save everything in existence? A fresh, nail-biting liberty of you're guaranteed to keep you turning the pages till the end. Um, and that's the novel description. That's I, I don't think it's quite true. Um, this story has issues. Um, I don't I don't dislike this story. I actually think that the the concept behind it is interesting. Um, I think it's kind of a neat conceptualization, really a really neat, neat enough premise. Um, I think the execution left something to be desired. Um, it has technical writing issues. If you look even at the novel description, there are a couple of spelling errors in there. Um, and in the story, that's kind of like they're definitely spelling and grammar errors throughout the entire thing. Um, however, the part that really bothered me um, on a write on a technical writing issue was definitely the formatting in the story, how how dialogue was handled. Um, dialogue on the, on the whole is stilted and kind of awkward. Um, and a big part of this is the fact that the main character isn't a gamer. So there's like this longer than I think needed question phase about basic gamer stuff that I think could have been skipped entirely. Um, additionally, there's a lot of text from the game God or the game AI. Um, and while it's not even hundred percent clear what the, this voice is necessarily, it is a separate character. And then talks to the main character and, and all both main characters in their minds about game stuff and answers questions and gives them data and information. Um, and even like encourage them to do things, right? Um, but the formatting is just different. And this is this is just a, a choice that the author made. It didn't work for me. The, instead of using dialogue tags like quotation marks and he he says she said, um, instead this voice um is actually separated from the rest of the novel with like um underscore lines so there's actually there's a little separation of the story where it's like oh underscore lines the ai's dialogue and then another underscoring going back to the main character's dialogue um and it was just, it's just a formatting choice that really just kind of broke the story flow and <laughs> messed with my reading experience because um my reason is I, you know, read the lines, you read the lines, and any kind of like word break like that is usually used to designate, oh, we're changing scenes entirely, right? Um, and because that's how my brain interpret it, it kind of just kind of took me out of the flow of the story every time I saw it, and it happens on a fairly regular basis, unfortunately. So that's one of the things that just kind of stopped me from enjoying the novel. On the story side of things, um, the story tries to be dark. I think in part of the the end matter of the, of the novel, the author's like, oh, I also write horror stories. And I think that influence is a lot more prominent in the beginning of the novel. And I almost feel like there is a unspoken promise that that's going to continue on, and it doesn't. And the, you could tell that the novel is, is and in some ways, she's trying to be dark, especially the beginning of the novel. Um because the main character, it starts off with the main character waking up in a cell in an asylum. And she's told she has to play the game, or she'll be stuck in that cell forever and just rot. And then she's told that if she dies, she's going to go to a different version of hell every time she dies before she respawns. And so there's like this, this like serious influence for her, like encouragement for her not to die. Um, and there's like this almost um, survival horror escape out of this asylum. That's the beginning of the story. And it definitely has this like this real horror vibe there. And it's done okay there, um, but I, I kind of expected to continue in the rest of the novel. And after like 20% of the story, um, that goes away almost entirely. And she, when she makes it like this, this safe zone um, and, and the quests there are much um, less horrific. And I think, again, the story tries to be darker. And I think maybe later on in the series, um, as the apocalypse happens, it's going to be more of a horror story with like this RPG mechanics in there. Um, but for here is it just kind of a disappointment that that did not continue. Instead, both the main character, uh, Natalie and Tra um, I think it's Travis, um, the other main character, yeah, Travis, um, their storylines are just a lot more normal. Um, they just kind of have this supernatural bent for the introduction of like ghost and um, dark spirits or like shadow demons, I think it is. Um, and I was just slightly disappointed that that horror, like actual horror aspect wasn't 
fall up. Um, and I would just, I, I just became super less interested in that. And I, those are more normalish things. Um, that's kind of is what it is. Uh, a lot of the non Natalie main character stuff is a lot of background. Um, and it kind of gives you like a, a larger world view. this like a little safe zone area. Um, and it's okay. It's just not bad writing or anything. It's just, it wasn't, um, as interesting as, as, as I thought it was going to be like that fall through for that horror thing was like, Oh, I was genuinely interested because it felt like that was different. And when it became something I've read like a lot of the times, um, it just wasn't as interesting. Now game mechanic wise, um, things tilt a little more towards survival horror, but there are levels and quests and experience points and stamina and stats and all the good stuff. One of the more interesting things about the story is the fact that the main character, the characters, the players, the luminaries as they're called, um, can actually redistribute their stats on the fly, which I thought, Oh, that's kind of a cheat ability. And it's used that when it's run interestingly enough. And that's fine. It is, it is, uh, consistently done. Um, but that's kind of the only like kind of new thing you'd probably see overall. I like the idea behind the story. Um, and again, I appreciate that there's attempt to write something darker. Um, the execution just didn't work for me. The writing didn't feel stilted, dialogue felt awkward. The horror aspects weren't tense when they were there. Um, and outside of that beginning section, the horror aspects kind of just fizzle out, to be honest. Like they don't continue on in the story. And so for me, the story just didn't really work. Um, it gets a score of six out of 10. Now again, not a bad review score. It's just that this doesn't work for me. It might work better for somebody else. Um, but for me, just didn't work. Uh, before Apocalypse Dungeons of Perdition, book number one, gets a score of six out of 10. And next we have Ian's Picks of the Week. This is a contribution from Ian Mitchell, a longtime literary community member who reads and reviews uh, almost as much as I do. Um, he was nice enough to submit some reviews every week recently um, for the podcast because he's reading different things. Even when you read the same things, he has often a different perspective. And I think that's um, enjoyed by the audience to get someone else's uh, a different kind of opinions. And also, it lets us review more stuff. So that's always fun. Um the first up on Ian's picks of the week is going to be Dungeon World, book number four, a Dungeon Core experience. I, I read book number one in the series and I just, I missed out on book number two, I think, and I couldn't get back. I, I can't start in book number four. I have to go back to book number two and then read two, three, and four. And so I'm really happy that Ian actually um, does read these because um, the series has been really well. Jonathan Brooks has done doing really good in his styles for this beautiful series. This is Ian's review. Excuse me. He says, nice ride, nice pacing, stopped at a good spot. I love the characters. Book number four was just enough to tell the large story without extra extraneous stuff. Little humor fill, frills are, of course, nice detailing. Large scale battles. Fred's still clueless about romantic advances, plus 10 protection versus harem. I like seeing the world of Dungeon Core's side of the story. He thinks it's a great read. He gives it a score of 8.4 out of 10. So um, I think a lot of the people actually really agree with that. This has been a very popular series for Jonathan Brooks, and I'm happy for him. Um, his next review is for The Last Time Loop, Max the Rebellion, Volume 1, a time travel literary series, which is a series, um, which is a series that we've actually read already on the uh, review for the main podcast for me. Uh, but this is Ian's review. He says, many variations. It's not Groundhog Day or Feedback Loop. The variations in each loop are interesting. When the action ramps up, the hero steps up. Interesting and exciting. I think it's a great direction for the genre. Seems most similar to the feedback loop, level up, endless online, with a touch of build the galactic hero. Um, he gives it a score of 8.8 .8 out of 10. So he thinks it's another great, great novel. Um, so there you go. Uh, and his last review is, of course, going to be... Oh, there we go. Um, the Ruin Smith, a green wood... Book number two, written by Galen Wolf. And of course, this is actually, I wish I reviewed this story when it first came out. Uh, for some reason, Amazon deleted our review. It's still on our, on our a little bit database, though. Um, I enjoyed it personally. It's actually really interesting story for me. But this is Ian's review. He says, a short story about a horrid person. And that's true. He says, I found this one to be horribly funny. I enjoyed Greenwood and thought I'd give this a try. I was laughing on the first page and through quite a bit of this one. Now I understand why the author was asking about villains on one of the groups. Not sure what else to say. It was an extremely fast read. Again, this is a short story. Um, he gives it a score of 8.2 out of 10. And I actually agree with that review score. I don't think I quite give it an eight. I don't remember. But I, I think my personal review was also pretty close to that. This is a short story. Um, 
this is not a nice character. He's not, he's, I wouldn't say he's quite maybe a villain, but he's not a nice person. And it's, it was kind of an interesting change. There's also crafting in the story. So that's always a little for me. Um, and it's short and it's kind of a nice little thing. And if you've read the other, uh, the portions of the Greenwood series by the same author, um, you're going to get like little cameos from characters you might enjoy as well. So, um, I definitely agree with this particular review and that's it for Ein's picks of the week. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening, for watching, for hanging out with us this week. We have uh, some links for some places you can find us at on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, and our webpage. Um, and, of course, some other Liberty groups uh, from Facebook that, that you can find and talk to your favorite Liberty authors and other community members who just love to talk about the genre. Um, and, of course, if you want to support the podcast in any way, shape, or form and help keep the podcast ad-free and free for everybody, you can find out all the ways to support us at litrbdpodcast.com slash support. Uh, and until we can hang out again, ladies and gentlemen. I want to again thank you for taking the time to listen to me and to and to to listen to the podcast and I hope it's always beneficial for you to hear some good reviews for some good stuff and hopefully it's led you down some great reading paths. Until we can hang it again, remember to read some little RPG.